I'm Larry Flick, and this is a very special edition of In Depth on Sirius XM. Special because I have two amazing queens in this room whom I am absolutely obsessed with. I mean, I follow them on social media. I know how often one of them eats tacos. I've watched her cry about the hotel rooms on the road. She's a very emo queen, and I kind of live for that. I live for that. She also has a brand new single that is unbelievable. It's called Freedom. And we're going to talk about that. That's Cameron Michaels over there. Hi, hello. How are you? And then we have, though, she's from season 10 of RuPaul's Drag Race. I guess I should say that they're both from RuPaul's Drag Race. I'm old school now. <laughs> exactly. And then we have the current reigning. How's that feel? Um, like someone probably fucked up along the way. But... <laughs> no, darling. There were no mistakes. Evie Oddly is the winner, the recently crowned winner of RuPaul's Drag Race Season 11. She also has a really fun, great new single called Dollar Sign. She, uh, That's Dollar Store. Dollar Store. Yeah, it's just spelled with a dollar sign, so it gets confusing. I'm a, I'm a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> but you already figured that out. Yeah. And, uh, and Evie is, is, honestly, she's... If, if, I have a feeling this is your normal beat. Um, it it really is actually. I just picked this makeup up off the pillow. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously we're here and we're doing this in celebration of Stonewall Pride Fifty on the day. The day that we're recording this conversation is the actual anniversary of the Stonewall riots that started the lesbian and gay liberation movement. It was not started as rainbows and parties. It was started by a bunch of fags, dykes, and queens who decided that they were tired of being harassed by the police. They were tired of having themselves dragged onto the streets of Christopher Street here in New York City and having their heads doused in buckets as public humiliation. This is a party, and we want you to party. But this is also an important day because it marks 50 years of an uprising that has undeniably changed the world. And so I want to begin with that, because the two of you are uh, smart people. Well, <laughs> debatable, debatable. I know you to be smart people, and, uh, and I also know you both to be conscious of the world around you. So I'm curious to start there as you're moving around. This is, this is like probably going to be the busiest 48 hours of your lives, mm. because the world is grabbing at you. So I want to know... At what point do you t are you able to take in not just the fun and the pressure and the work and the exhaustion, but also what it means to be you? I mean, for me, it's it's kind of the gift that I get when I do get to be on stage, especially when I'm like taking a bow or a second to breathe and not really perform as much as I get to see the audience. If I get to see an audience I'm I'm gonna break down in tears because it's just magical to see that many queer faces out being as well as queer as fucking possible <laughs> and and being out and proud and supporting something that they love that's also a celebration of being like unnecessarily queer <laughs> so any any time I'm on stage is really my favorite time to get to reflect on what it means to be 50 years deep in a movement that should have been should have been centuries old by now. Cameron? I, I think for me, it's kind of along the same thing. Um, you know, we didn't, we weren't, this didn't come easy for us. You know, pe we, had, we had to work to get here. And, you know, now we're in a, uh, living in a society where marriage equality has happened, which I'm sure for them, as for me, I thought I would never see that in my lifetime. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's something <laughs> I never thought I would see and now it's what we're four years into it. Um, so that's amazing. And for me traveling the world, it's just so exciting to see all the queer individuals around the world. That's We're global and that is an amazing thing. And I think for me, the most important thing is, you know, I just released my song and a lot of people around the world really connected with my American lyrics from season 10. And so it's very exciting for me to do something that connects with people. You know, I'm no American Idol singer. I know that. But I just wanted to send a positive message to the queer community. And I'm really excited for them to hear it. Well, it's a great. And we're going to play both uh, both uh, Cameron and Evie songs at the end of this broadcast so you can hear them in total. They're both terrific. Mm -hmm. um, 
when was the last time you were discriminated against? You know, I feel like uh, discrimination is something that I, I face every day. I didn't. That's part of the reason I became a drag queen is because walking through life as black, gay, femme, like gender queer individual, it it people always found something to discriminate against me, and I still get to see it in the microaggressions I face daily. Uh, both from people who mean well and people who quite clearly don't. So, like, the last time was probably this morning. <laughs> Cameron? Um, I think for me, it used to be daily, multiple times a day. Um, I can't think of an instance in recent history. Um, I think the one that stands out to me the most that I do recall is having – come out of high school where I don't hear it as often anymore. I remember being in New Orleans one year um, and it wasn't Mardi Gras, nothing crazy. It was one of my first couple times in New Orleans. And I remember being called a fag out loud on the street in front of everyone. Um, and you know, it hadn't happened to me since I was a kid. And I remember that it still happens to everyone on the daily. So that reminded me, you know, it's still out there and it still happens all the time. One of the reasons why I'm especially happy that it's the three of us having this conversation today is because through my observations, being a typical fan, stalking you both on social media, <laughs> knowing a little bit about your stories by way of TV, um, I think that we each have something really important in common that may not be obvious to most people, which is that even within the queer population, we face discrimination. Yeah. Right? There are... There are people who, you know, discriminate against me because of my body or because of my age. Um, I feel like, Cameron, you've gotten a, a tough go because of your tattoos, because of your muscles. Are you queeny enough? Are you femme enough? Are you this enough? Are you that enough? And I feel, yep. like, I feel like if anyone really wants to talk about what your drag experience was on TV, and I would like to get into it at some point, is... I felt like you were watching it. I felt like you were gun shy because of the experiences that you had yeah. in life. Yeah. And then I just look, you know, to me, I also know that we live in a racist. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you my grinder if you don't believe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so, so it's racism, it's colorism, it's all kinds of stuff, right? It's even within the black population, right? Are you dark enough? Are you light enough? Are you, are you butch enough? That is my this? favorite thing, actually, is that it's so complex that people assume racism and, and colorism all comes from one place or one community. And I've, I've always felt discriminated against, even, even within identities that I consider myself to be. Like, as a gay guy, I'm discriminated against or discriminated against by other gay guys. As as a black man, I've I've been told plenty of times that I'm not black enough or that I'm whitewashed and vice versa about uh about whether or not I could do something because I'm too black. So it's it's funny because I think it still exists definitely within our communities and the more we can speak about it, maybe the closer we are to getting it squashed. <laughs> do, I, do I dare ask either of you to ponder whether it's sometimes worse among our supposed own people? I think it's worse but specifically because there's this familiarity because we're all we all already get to be the norm like when you're in a, a queer space you're no longer the outsider and therefore that thing that usually puts you below so to speak uh let's say like a cis straight white male uh is like suddenly washed away and you get to pick the other differences that you choose to be better or worse. It's like how we, how we get our, our karmic like superiority complexes. How have you dealt with the discrimination that you've had put, put upon you, Cameron? Um, don't talk. I don't know. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was my go-to um, throughout most of my life. Um, people are always not going to like, there's always going to be someone that's not liking what you're doing. It's never going, there's never going to be a moment in your life where 100% of people that are watching what you're doing are happy with it. 
It could be 80%, 70, 50. As long as you are doing something that inspires people, that you're happy with, that's not harming anyone, you can't pay attention to the negativity that's gonna come along with it. I've already found negativity from my new song. <laughs> but the positive, she's like, I know, I get it. The positivity that I've had from it completely squashes any negativity that's come with it. It's just, you just can't pay attention to it. You can't, you'll never get ahead in life if you pay attention to the negative. But, but you did say something very interesting at the beginning that I want to get into, which mm -hmm. is you just don't talk because <laughs> because you are even like upon introduction, a, a, I, I, I take it as shyness, being uh -huh. a fellow shy person, yeah. that you just have to find the energy to push out when it's time to push out. Yeah. But how much of that is also just like... I just don't want to be, I don't want to deal. I don't want to be hurt today. <laughs> well, I think like she can connect to this as well. Like we are on all the time. That's what it is now. We are expected to be on all the time and you can't be on all the time. It's just, it's not reality. So, you know, there are some points where I'm in my headphones just like chilling at the airport. And I, don't, I totally don't mind saying hi to people, but like I probably look really antisocial in the corner on my headphones, just like having my own time during that day, you know, we're traveling, we're doing meeting greets, we're doing gigs. Um, so sometimes we just need to take our little moment with our headphones and listen to some badass rap music. I don't know. Oh my God, that is always my answer. <laughs> is it your answer? That is, that's legit what I was doing this morning while getting ready. It's like what gets me in the zone, it puts me in my own space and it makes me feel like another layer of invincibility and also of like, please leave me alone. <laughs> I feel so validated right now. I honestly do because all yeah. I do is put out the signal, don't come near me. Until, until I'm ready for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Until I'm ready for you. Yeah. Because, you know, I don't have people coming at me nearly at the quantity that you do, but when you do, when you talk for a living, mm -hmm. People, people are bound to. Write. I understand. They want you to talk. I laugh yeah. for a living. I always just say the meter ain't running, bitch. <laughs> yeah. I go, yeah, tell me, tell me when you're gonna put some coin in the cup, and then we'll talk. Yeah. Um, so, what, what did you listen to this morning? Um, I've been. I just went on this like rap caviar playlist. I love that station so just, much. Just because I've been listening to like my own music way too much, and I've been beating <laughs> Megan the Stallion, Megan Same. the Stallion, into the ground. She's just like this nasty, freaky Houston rapper. Just like I love the way she uses her tongue. I'm so about it. <laughs> what are you listening? To? What are you listening? To? Um. I, I love rap caviar. I kind of like go through moods. Um, now I'm kind of in a house mood. So um, I think housework. I think it's actually mm, W-E-R-K yeah. is the name of it. That's my house. I like was raised on yeah. house. Yeah. That's my station uh, right my, now. That's my jam. Mm -hmm. That's my thing. Um, okay. So the other thing, let's like talk about how, another reason why people sometimes are confused. Gender. <laughs> 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 because it's very complicated yeah you know when i was coming up it was less complicated because we didn't feel like we had the options you know right. i came out over 30 years ago and it was the early 80s and you know we were just happy to like throw on some eye makeup and listen to culture club <laughs> we thought we were living cute and radical mm -hmm. um and so now there's a certain freedom to explore what gender means to you. And it doesn't have to be he or she. It could be they. It could be it. It could be whatever you want. It could be, you know, Herman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it's especially complicated when you do drag, right? Because the thing that is, particularly with you, Cameron, you know, you are a very masculine looking fellow sitting in front of me. <laughs> I don't know. About, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm when a you're, sissy, but thank you. But you know what I mean. But yeah. you know. But but when you're in drag, you are hardcore fish. You are like feminine down from the outfits to the makeup. You don't do clowny makeup. You do. Girly makeup. Yeah, I think that was my that was my challenge. Is I went into the show and people pegged me as I guess the trade was the term. Um, so I was just like dismissed as oh he's just a cute boy that's the only reason he's there um and then i think people realize on my third episode when i walked out with a feather runway i love costumes i love makeup i love the art of drag and i think it's been important for me the past year and a half to really showcase that and get away from that stigma that i was given of being just a hot boy so do you have any what are, what's your relationship with gender 
So you, do you find yourself questioning your relationship with gender as you dig deeper into your drag life? What's funny is for me, the is, is that drag actually answered most of my questions about gender. I remember growing up uh, having conversations with my friends and being like, I feel as if I'm a woman who's trapped in a man's body, but also I'm enjoying all of the, the like, the different, like, avenues and routes I, I have by being masculine and it was just complex but I think as the vocabulary evolves and as much and as we learn to break down the binary literally it's it's become a lot easier for me to not even have to worry about am I a woman am I a man am I an alien it, it does it really doesn't matter I don't care now and that's what drag has given me is the freedom of not caring what my gender is and so when do you remember the moment when you started to have that that clarity that light bulb oh this doesn't matter anymore yeah i've I, I, it really was when i started throwing myself in into drag because at first i would um buy all of these women's clothing so to speak and i'd feel the need to like hide them or like shove them away when when boys were around and then after a while, I just had accumulated so much that it was impossible to try and hide any other sort of side of myself, even if I wanted to. And I just began dabbling in and mixing literally everything. Some days I'll wear a dress and like combat boots and some days I'll, I'll wear heels and a suit. It, it doesn't matter. So I'm curious to know if you've gotten what kind of pushback you've gotten for your drag, because I would, again, as, a, as an observer, I would say, oh, this is the definition of gender fuck, gender queer, right? You don't do, you're pretty, but you don't aim for pretty. You aim for, you know, you actually, what I love about your drag and the reason why I was rooting for you all season is because you found pretty and ugly. Yeah, that's one of my favorite There's things. gorgeousness and ugly. And, you know, so, but people who are looking for the female impersonation are confused by that and I've, i fully understand it because like i said there hasn't always been the best vocabulary surrounding breaking down the walls of what we thought was possible as far as gender goes and as far as drag goes but i've i'm never going to be like traditionally beautiful fishy but that doesn't mean i can't play with it just like i'm never going to be actually a blue person but that doesn't mean i can't play with it i think it's but just you, fun you know exploration you, i saw you do fishy once or twice on your season yeah i mean i can do it and i don't think there's absolutely anything wrong with it i think people always get it in their minds that there's like artsy queens and then there's fishy queens or whatever and you can't there they have to be butting heads but i like using drag specifically because it is this tool to explore all the areas, all the gray spaces, everything in between, and I'd get so fucking bored if I was doing anything over and over again, whether yeah. that was fishy or whether that was alien shit. So, <laughs> when did you first become, each of you become aware of Drag Race? What season? Gosh. Um, I mean, season one. I mean, like, I mean, as but soon as... you like... God, well, I don't even remember. I mean, <laughs> I don't I mean, say that sarcastically. I don't know how old you are. I, I mean, have we have have we had a season every? I can't remember. We've like, had chron one every year. Yeah, we've had one every year. year. I mean, so, so thirty-two minus eleven. I don't do math. I do makeup. So whatever okay. that is. So <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. So so she's older than she looks. Um. <laughs> I remember I was fifteen when I was flipping through the channels uh, late night on logo and came across like these crazy clown looking ass bitches and really really cheap clothing <laughs> and i was so intrigued that i ended up binge watching the whole first season of drag race and that's actually how i found like logo gay media period mm -hmm. uh, that was my first branching into growing into a gay adult so i asked that because it's interesting to kind of mark the timeline right so you became aware of the show fairly young when did you become aware of what the show does in terms of changing lives, not just in terms of you're on TV, everyone's a little more famous after they've been on TV, but it's sort of like whether you win or lose, it's the Willy Wonka golden ticket if yeah. you play your cards right. Um, if you know what you're doing, you can, we, we saw with, with Vanjie, you can take one episode and turn it into a career. Yeah. So 
when did you become aware of what it could do and when did it start to become appealing as an idea i mean i always did drag because i loved drag i did drag years before the show you know people think i just kind of popped up i was doing drag when i was 18 years old 17 actually so i've been doing it for a very long time um but i think watching the show i mean we remember all these amazing queens from the first like three or four seasons but i think once you hit like between four to six is when I think you really started seeing the fame and the popularity um, and the message that Drag Race was spreading um, about, you know, queer inclusivity and all the things that come with being queer and on TV um, in a positive light. You know, there's always going to be a little bit of negative backlash from it. But now that it's on VH1, I think it's just exploded into this phenomenon. And it's really amazing to watch. I started seeing the, uh, the beginnings of this all happen around, was it... I think it was like season six for me when we had Bianca and mm -hmm. Adore and Courtney who all after the show were able to make careers that started splashing over into the mainstream. I remember seeing Bianca and Adore's uh, Starbucks ad and being so blown away because I never thought I'd see drag queens like gay people for starters, but especially not drag queens on my daytime ass television. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. It was. You know, I mean, to yeah. see Adore a chart, you know. That, that no, definitely. No shade, but charting higher than Rue ever charted. And that, I think that's what really changed my perspective from being like, oh, this is how you could be celebrated as a drag queen to be like, oh, you can make a career out of this even outside of the gay clubs. Yeah. So when do you discover that it's amazing, but that there's a dark side? <laughs> that actually for every five loonies like me, there are one or two who are just going to be dark as fuck. I kind of, I mean, it's been happening. I don't know about you, but you know, for me, I mean, it's been happening for a long time, but I think I kindly, kindly, what kind of word is that? <laughs> <laughs> Fi finally, I finally realized it the other day, you know, people that leave negative comments or do negative things on the internet, are really unhappy. You know, my parents used to tell me when you people you get made fun of when you're younger, oh, they're just jealous or oh, they're unhappy. And you don't believe it. You think they're just mean. But in all actuality, it's like when I sit and put myself in that position, I've never done that. I've never been mean to someone on the internet. I've never said anything negative about someone's positive um, things happening for them in life. And those people are just unhappy. And they don't have anyone to take that out on, maybe. Maybe they're in like a, a job they're not happy with, a relationship they're not happy with. Maybe they don't have you know, a positive influence in their family. Um, and they're just in a very negative space and they're gonna take it out on someone. And who better than these popular people on the internet that they can just troll. So um, that's when I realized I, it, it doesn't get to me anymore. And it's I mean, always going to happen. So it sounds like you see that they're like, it's not even you that they're yelling at. No, it's, a, it's whoever they're they want to pick on idea. that day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they'll pick anyone. Anyone that they feel they want to make a comment about, it's going to make them feel powerful or make them feel better to feel like they have control over some situation to say something. And it's it's just always going to be like that. And you just can't pay attention to that. Did you ever regret going to the public eye being, uh, afterward? No, not at all. Um, <laughs> I mean, the week that Cracker went home, I kind of hid. <laughs> <laughs> I, hit, I, hit, I hit in a dark corner because I knew it was going to be like that. But no, um, especially like watching my song come out and, and again, like re again, revisiting the American lyrics that inspired so many people, or at least my fans. Um, I'm here for a reason and I'm happy about that. And there's nothing that can take that away from me. What about you, Evie? Like, do I regret any like going on the show or even? I mean, you're still you're still like <laughs> freshly popped. She's still in the warmer. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm still uh, just learning how to crawl again. So I I there are definitely parts of being in the public eye I don't like, but strangely enough, the parts I don't like are aren't the negative comments. I don't I don't give a shit about the negative comments, mostly because I have this really, really probably unhealthy view that most people aren't worth my time and the ways that you become worth my time are by proving that you have like some goodness. So if you prove that you're a piece of shit, then I'm like, well, next. <laughs> very smart. Mm -hmm. It's very smart. So if you don't mind, I want to talk a little bit about each of your seasons, okay? Um, Cameron, mm -hmm. what's it like 
to continually have to prove yourself on the main stage, lip syncing? What was that like for you? Because, I mean, honestly, as a viewer, it was exciting because it was like, okay, so what's this bitch going to do this time? Because you really were the assassin of your season. Mm -hmm. But, and I feel like you did better than, I think sometimes they put you in the bottom just because they wanted you to lip sync, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> there were a couple of times where I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. So what was that like, though? How do you, how do you keep hope? Because what people don't re realize, or maybe you do or you don't think about it, is we're getting like three, four months of a show that's filmed in the space of like three and a half weeks, yeah. maybe four. Mm -hmm. So that's like intense. That's going to mess with you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, they definitely put you through the ringer. And I mean, I don't think it's any secret that we're all sequestered and kept from each other. So anything that you see is happening on set. They don't allow us to talk to each other. So they save all the energy and all the drama for on camera. And I think me being in the bottom so many times, I'm just a fighter. It's always how I am. I don't have to talk. I just show up and do what I do. <laughs> and that's just how I've always existed. I don't necessarily talk, but when the time is right, I'm there. And I think that's what people connected about my performance and my drag aesthetic versus me as a, as a boy. Um, I think the one time you can see me really start to give up was, I think, the third lip sync. Yeah, the third one was Cracker. Um, which I have my like war paint on in that, in that, in that phase. And I remember, I don't know if it aired. I can't remember. There were a few episodes I didn't watch cause they were too hard, honestly. Um, and I remember Michelle, apparently I was so stoic in that moment when they told me I was in the bottom for the third time, Michelle thought I was staring daggers through her. Like she thought I was angry and I was just like, press play, just press play, press play. <laughs> that didn't press make it play. On the air, but... I was just ready to go again. I was, I'm just a fighter. So, but that was your best lip sync. I think I was mad. I was pissed. I was so <laughs> mad. I took that outfit and made it in like a couple hours. And like I got, I was working on two hours of sleep that night because I had to make that other costume. Mm. And I was angry. I was very angry that <laughs> the day. The makeup was powerful. That's what I do. I get mad or I get angry and I just like warrior full makeup. out. Yeah. It was honestly going to war makeup. Yeah, it was. <laughs> so, Evie. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it seems like there were there were two two sets of uh, the season. There's one set where internally people thought you were being bitchy, <laughs> and out in the world where we were going, um, she's right, <laughs> <laughs> she's right, <laughs> she's right. <laughs> um, when did you start to realize that you weren't actually being bitchy? That you were actually that what you were was the truth sayer of the season. I mean, I never, I, I don't think it was ne necessarily like nice. I'm not going to pretend I was delivering these bitches like cupcakes and shit. But, but you weren't being, you weren't being. <laughs> but harsh. no, that's the thing is I wasn't ever being bitchy. I wasn't ever going on to make good TV. Like that was never my intent. It's just, I really do have such a low tolerance for bullshit that when these girls, I feel like one of our natural defense mechanisms as humans is just to deflect anything bad that has happened to us. So what kept happening is these bitches would like get put in the bottom and be like, well, it's okay because actually I'm just going to lip sync my way all the way there. And it just triggers me to be like, no bitch, like pay attention, turn around. I never, I never thought I was bitchy. I just thought from the start that I was the one girl who was going to always just slap those like French vanilla fantasies out of bitches' hands. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you both really, you both made it to the final. Um, both came in the wake of the big Sasha Valor final. That kind of <laughs> <laughs> right? that's, what, that's what all of us civilians call it. I mean, uh -huh. we know. And so your season, Cameron, some of your castmates, not you actually, I always note that, came out looking like baked potatoes. Reveal gate. <laughs> right? I believe it was a popcorn back for us, but yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and you just kind of came out and you had like, you know, an undergarment and an mm -hmm. overgarment. Yeah. So when you're, when you won your, your round, mm -hmm. how did you feel? Because you I mean, look like you wanted to kill yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just going to be real. You look like you wanted to like 
sh- but that was like the yourself. fourth time for me like <laughs> of wanting to be like okay I, I, I can bow out gracefully I can go home now but I realized and you I made ha- the final so there's but ever honor. since, like, I felt bad when Monet, Monet went home, I felt bad when Cracker went home, like, every single one. And then for me to do it again on the stage in the finale, I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Over a stage like, of how did I get to this moment? <laughs> um, and I, and like, when you watch that lip sync, I had no clue what was going on. So I was just doing my own thing like I always do. And then later I found out what happened. Well, they had that great shot of you looking down. Right? Oh, You're this one? Like... You mean that one? <laughs> <laughs> it was everything. That meme. <laughs> And see, honestly, that's the one where I felt the most bad for you because people really love Asia. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. I was just lip- I was doing you my normal do- thing. Like- and then all of a sudden, I'm like, this bitch had mechanical fucking butterflies. I was like, okay, okay, she pulled out tricks. And so I was like, okay, whatever. And then I looked down at towards the end, and I was like, Oh, those aren't mechanical, are they? <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, as the crowd's like cheering and Rue's like making her decision who to keep in the back of my head, I'm like, oh fuck, I killed like forty butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> because you were literally slamming your, your ah, people like you your pussy slammed on all on all the on all the butterflies. And I was like, <laughs> 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 I was like, I, t- I mean, because that's like, a Cameron Michaels lip sync is. Slam. Oh my yeah. god, you're the real lip sync assassin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, Peter should have been outside your door. I'm the monarch assassin. <laughs> so, so, how do you, how did you, how did you mentally prepare in the 10 minutes you had for that final? Because I'm, th- I'm thinking you're, th- you're believing you're not going to make it to the very last lip sync. Yeah, I, I mean, I, at that point, I was just, I'm just happy to be here. Um, yeah, I was, I was very happy. And then when she said that, I was like, okay, so I'm really made it all the way to the very end. I was like, oh my god. But at that point, I was, I was so calm that day. Like whatever my face read on stage, I was not nervous that entire day. And you can probably say the same thing. Like we made it all the way to the end. We've proved ourselves. We're just here to have fun exactly. and just do what we do. And I know you felt that in your last lip sync. And that's what we did. We just had fun because we made it. I mean, the only time you looked miserable was when they said, Cameron, you win. <laughs> just every time they told me to stay, I was miserable. Um, yeah, I was just ha- I was just so happy to be there. I was nervous for the like the 15 minutes we had to get ready for the second one. But I mean, I was I was just I was just excited. I was happy. So. My intel tells me, and I want you to tell me the truth, Evie. Uh oh, I'm not good that, at that. Is that after the big potato reveals of season ten, they told you guys to think a little bit more wisely about how you were going to approach the last two lip syncs. I mean, they didn't like. Please don't kill anybody. <laughs> please look like you're wearing actual drag and not a box. I didn't get any of of that specifically. They did tell us that they were going to double check everything that we were wearing and triple check and no live butterflies and no fire. Mm-hmm. Um but also after reveal gate, like bitch, I didn't wanna I didn't want to try and go that way. Like God bless all the girls who that's their biggest trick that they have to pull in the book. But I feel like drag and why Sasha Sasha Velour's reveal was important in the first place is it told a story. It had this very cohesive, dramatic feel that makes you feel like you're you're on fucking Broadway watching a beginning to end play in the span of a song. And so I wanted to try especially since people didn't see that out of me and especially since I felt like I was going to be going up against Brooklyn in my heart of hearts for the end. I wanted to show people how I can approach drag and still give like a really entertaining performance without like throwing my body on the ground or committing butterfly genocide. <laughs> So, but, but in another way, you made it harder though because it, both outfits looked really heavy. <laughs> yeah. I they mean, they both looked very heavy and they looked hot. They they I were mean, they looked beautiful. They were, but you know, they looked they looked hard to perform in. Well, and that was also another thing that personally I always thought about when I was doing the runways on the season. And that definitely came into play here is you always have to balance out like, do I want to present more of a fashion statement or do I want to be ready to lip sync for my motherfucking life? And I wanted I wanted to challenge myself because I wanted to make sure that I could walk out onto the final stage and look like I deserve to be crowned in any of my outfits, because for me, that's what a finale feels like. And also that I could do some cool ass shit in them like we practiced 
in my hotel room backflipping in that gown and headpiece a few times just to make sure that like nothing would get caught or I wouldn't decapitate myself. Because uh, just even that headpiece, how much did that weigh? It was like a good five pounds. It was nothing. Really? Nothing my head hasn't felt before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, 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 I saw the, the, uh, the reveal of, the version, the the ending that they they pick, because obviously, if you also didn't know, they film multiple endings. Mm -hmm. of um, you look like you look actually you look the way Cameron looked when he was told <laughs> he was was staying. You look you look like pained. Okay, so I, that's really funny because when we were talking about Cameron's like pained look for the first time, it like clicked to me that. Every girl on the seat on the show who's ever been like, I feel bad because my sisters are gone. We're actually going through something real. I felt a little bit guilty or ashamed even of ashamed, ashamed because I mean, I, I still think my drag is the shit. I think what I do is the shit. I love doing it and I'm probably going to do it until it kills me. But in the context of purely the competition in the TV show, I did not do the best i did not win the most challenges and it felt a little painful to be around girls who had put in as much work as i did and even though they weren't smart enough to fucking grow from critiques they like had better track records than i did and it felt a little i just felt a little guilty about like wearing wearing a crown that i know that they all like were working to wear as well that they would have worn with like grace and pride and dignity and here i am going to be like a dollar store scent clown <laughs> but do you, but, i mean have you given any thought to what your win means to people yeah and that's how i've kind of calm calm myself out of that guilt is because i think at the end of the day if if it wasn't for uh my track record my story definitely really helped make the statement that I wanted to make on the show, which is that there's so many experiences that people are just blocking out because they're not willing to be open-minded, to try mm -hmm. something new, to listen to an individual who has a different story and a different perspective in life than yours, and to really respect them instead of just writing them off. You know, the, again, it, it, it worked out really at the last minute that it would be Cameron Evie and me sitting in the studio alone together today, y'all. And it feels cosmic because of what what I feel like I know and what I feel like I know even better now after this conversation has been the road. Because I think that for both of you, you represent people, not just queens, but you rep represent people who don't normally get the kind of shine <laughs> that, that you guys have gotten yeah. whether it be the physicality or the introvertedness or you know whatever the fuck i do <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know it was it was pretty remarkable that you you know wound up having to share so much of what your physical life is like so uh, is your how is your health these days are you in good shape you look good. Oh, thank you. It's all the baggy clothing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's something that I'm always going to be struggling with, and I I am still trying to find that balance because I want to get out and see the world, and I don't want to like possibly ruin my career by having to take too much time off or shit like that. But I also won't have a career if I don't have a body. I won't ever get to meet the fans if I can't roll my ass off a plane. I think one of the most uh, powerful moments I've ever seen in the show is when you talked about how someday you're just not going to be able to do what you're doing now because of your body. And so I, I, I sit here with you and I wonder how loudly do you hear the clock? It's, it's, it's scary because some days it's really there and I'm worried that I, I should just like quit now while I'm ahead-ish. <laughs> um, and it really, it does get difficult sometimes, but there are also days when I wake up and I feel like I'm 12 again and I'm just out like flipping and, and doing my handsprings and just running around and it, it feels good. So I'll never, I don't, I don't feel like I'll ever really know until I 
literally start breaking things. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just slowly going to lose skill after skill until all I can do is paint and bitch at people. Listen, there's a lot of money. In there. <laughs> Ask Bianca Del Rio. <laughs> That's a full theater show. <laughs> exactly. All right, so I want to talk about the records. Let's talk about freedom. Because mm. we've been... because. You did have the most impactful verse on American. Thank you. <laughs> it was a great vocal. You were the only one who could sing. And, <laughs> and listen, I, I don't, ain't nobody paying me but this company, so I'll say whatever I want. Um, you can sing. The lyrics were really powerful. You saw how the judges and how the world responded to it. Mm -hmm. It was pretty, it was like, it was a light bulb moment Yeah. for for anyone watching it. So... I know that you've been kind of waiting for the right time to do a record, and you waited a minute, and mm -hmm. I think it was smart of you to wait a minute. Uh, it wasn't really by choice; it was by overworking myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so, but um, so but I found So, what was it about this song that said to you, "Now I'm ready"? You know, I didn't even plan on writing the song. Honestly, I knew I wanted to do a small EP. I knew I wanted to do some kind of music, just to not because I think I'm an amazing singer, I know that I'm not, but I can carry a tune and I wanted to do something fun. And that's all I wanted to do was a project for myself. I've been working my ass off all year on tour after tour after tour after tour. I've never missed a work the world date since I got on the, since I got on the tour. So I've been working my ass off and I wanted to do something for me and I haven't got to in the year and a half since the show. Um, so I walked in knowing I wanted to do like three or four songs for an EP and that song just happened. They started placing stuff, production in the track. Um, Sam Doris and I started kind of like bouncing lyrics off of each other um, and it just became freedom. It wasn't even meant to be. I just started popping in American inspiration from that lyric, from that verse in American and it just happened. It, it We wrote it in, in like eight hours in the studio. So I feel like as I was listening to it, I feel like someday you're going to write something. I feel like you're a singer songwriter waiting to. I love writing lyrics. I do. Come out. Mm -hmm that someday you're gonna try it without a beat. Because I, I just, as a guy who's, I've spent 35 years in music. Yeah. I just feel like that's your calling. Because I would love there's to something that. there. Yeah, I love, I love poetry, I loved um, things like that. It's, it's artistic um, and you know, I, can't, I can't draw, I'm not an art, I mean I draw on my face, but <laughs> I, I'm very jealous of people that can draw. Um, so I guess maybe poetry or lyricism is mm -hmm. my other outlet outside of drag or makeup. So Evie, your song was exactly the right track for the moment. It was fun, it was playful, but it has a message. Yeah. It gets it it, it it's one of those like if you actually pay attention, it's going to hit you right between the <laughs> eyes. Um, when did you start to realize that your your best weapon is your ability to be subversive? Um I mean, that's it really all has been this sort of magical, serendipitous blossoming with falling in the drag because when I fell into doing drag, when I like tripped and stumbled onto this cool new art form, I realized that the ways that I was doing it weren't always vibing with people, weren't always going to be the easiest route to take to get the most people to like me. And I realized that that was kind of what I enjoyed about it is I wanted to be that other thing the thing that's missing the shocking factor so i don't know i just i've always as as, as far as drag goes i've always known that that's what i want to represent and getting to take that to like a whole nother level and exploring new mediums like making music for example has been has been so much fun because i was always standing in my own way by worrying about whether or not i'd be good at it it's very i mean the approach is very Same. punk rock the track i mean even though it's not a punk rock track, it feels do you know what i mean it feels very downtown smell the dirt kind of kind of vibration well and it's funny that you say that because i feel as if rap is the new genre that is the new punk rock that is it is replaced rock stars rappers are the new rock stars because they're out there uh unabashedly living their truths and being so in your face about it that it turns half of our population off like automatically <laughs> and that's that's what i loved so i wanted to play onto that even more and write right within like that realm right within that experience but uh to something that i actually know how to relate to like kind of pokes fun at 
uh, how also extravagant rap has become a, about being. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a silly question, and this one you're asked every day. Do you know what you're doing in the future? Or are you just thinking, let me get through Pride Weekend and I'll, I'll get back to you? I mean, somebody asked me yesterday what time my show is tomorrow, um, Saturday, and I said, I have no fucking clue. I don't, I don't like looking at my calendar. I don't want to. Um, there's so much in it. If I looked at it, like I know Asia is one that Asia looks at every bank statement she gets. She looks at every single calendar date. She looks at every show. She looks at every venue. And I just can't, I can't, I can't function like that. It's too mm -hmm. much. So I will look, before I fly out, I'll look at my weekend, three days, two days, wherever venue I'm at. I'll plan for the weekend, pack my shit and go. I can't, I can't know that much in advance. It's too much. So does that mean that you don't dream big for your future? No, I definitely have big dreams. Like this entire year and a half that I've been traveling the globe and doing work the world and doing all these amazing things, I knew in the back of my head I wanted to do a music project for myself. It was just finding the time. Um, so I, I have my dreams and my aspirations and my goals. It's fitting them into the rest of my <laughs> busy schedule, which I'm sure she's very aware of now, that just sometimes it doesn't happen when we need it to. I mean, what what... What do you want to do with the rest of your life, Evie? I'm, I want to continue surprising myself. That's the thing is, much like, much like Cameron, I also don't like looking at the immediate of what's coming up. I don't like looking at what I have to get done because it, it clouds my what I would like to do instead. So I'm always playing this balance of trying to catch up with reality and make sure that I'm prepared for the jobs that I have signed up for. <laughs> but also, I just want to leave some space for myself to make art in the future. I just, I learned this year that I like rapping. That's something that I'd never thought was really a part of me before. So I want to explore that. I want to explore being on stage, on film. I just want to make more fucking art and shove it down people's throats. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good way of looking at it. I mean, I want to thank you both for coming to visit in the midst of the hailstorm that is this weekend. It means a lot to me personally, and I know it means a lot to the people who are listening, um, to get a chance to hear about your thoughts and your views and your lives separate from the silliness is really so gratifying, and I appreciate it. I appreciate it a lot. Well, thank you.